the Commodore 128. These machines were designed with no real purpose in mind, they were kind of the jack of all trades. But there might be a few reasons that you want to pick up a Commodore 128. Be it that you want to run an original C64 game with some Commodore 128 enhancements. Maybe you want to play a more recent release that is also 128 enhanced. Or maybe you just want to play around with the VDC chip and see what it can do. These are all good reasons to get a Commodore 128. And it's more than just a Commodore 64. So today we're going to check out the hardware differences between these three machines and uh, see which one we think is the best. Obviously we've got our 128 flat over here. The one in the middle here is the 128D which is the plastic case and the one on the end here is the 128DCR which has the metal case. So let me turn all these off because they're making quite a racket and we'll take a look at the hardware see if we can figure out which one is the best one to go for today. Right that's better. Now I should mention that if you live in North America then you're pretty much limited to the 128 flat or the 128 DCR. The 128D did not come out in North America so unless you plan on importing one uh, your options are pretty limited there. So um, without further ado let's check out these machines in a bit more detail. Obviously with the 128 flat you don't get the built-in disk drive and you also don't get a built-in power supply so you're going to have an external brick and you're going to need something else to load software with. Now with the 128Ds you obviously get a built-in floppy disk drive. These are actually 1571 floppy disk drives but they do also work with 1541 formatted media along with MFM formatted media so they pretty much cover almost everything you'd expect to see on a five and a quarter inch disc. So that's a big plus for the 128Ds. Not only do you get a built-in power supply, but you also get built-in floppy disk drive. Although that being said, I do still kind of like the look of the flat Commodore 128. Let's have a look around the side. So not much to report on here. There is literally just a power switch on the 128D and the rest of them are just blank. You will notice that there is also a carry handle on 128D and this under here is actually our keyboard. We'll come back to that soon enough. Looking at the rear, things are more or less the same with all these. We've got our expansion port for our cartridges or whatever else is going to interface directly with the 128. We've got a cassette port on the flat 128 and the 128D, but not the DCR. We've got our serial port, which uh, is for our floppy disk drives or printers, whatever runs on the serial bus. Our analog video output, this is what the VIC-2 still outputs as, same as the Commodore 64. We've got an RF output, which nobody would ever want to use these days. Our RGB digital output, this is very similar to the CGA standard. This is what the VDC chip uses. And finally, our user port, all the same there. Obviously, the D versions also have an IEC port for the power input. And the metal case also has our on and off switch, which uh, on this one was over here on the side. Finally, on this side of the machine, things get a little bit different. The flat 128 has our power input and on and off switch, a reset button and our control port inputs. The other ones also have a reset button along with a recessed reset button, which is actually for the built-in disk drives. So you can reset them without resetting the machine. Again, we've got our controller port inputs and on the metal DCR version, this is where our cassette port lives. Now, this could be an issue if you want to use something like the SD to IEC. You've got to be able to plug this part into the serial connector, which is at the back of the machine, and this part into the tape port connector. On a normal Commodore 64 or 128, that's fine, but on the DCR, uh, you're kind of out of options. And even if you get an extension to run the serial cable around to the back, there's another issue because this port is actually recessed and these things generally have 
a case that sticks out wider than the port itself, it won't actually go in there. So um, keep that in mind if you want to use an SD to IEC with a Commodore 128 DCR. You can of course get something like the back bit cartridge or the Kung Fu Flash or even a Pi 1541 device. They should all work just fine. Um, just be wary of anything that needs to plug in to the tape port. Not much to report on on the underside of the cases. I think there was a label on the flat 128, but that's just come off over time. And the 128D, which is the plastic case, actually has its keyboard locked into place. So there's two tabs here to release it. And the cable itself actually folds back up into the case. So not only do we have a little carry handle, but we can also stow our keyboard away. That's kind of a neat trick, but uh, good luck stowing a CRT monitor away with that as well. Now, contrary to popular belief, myself included, the 128DCR was not metal due to FCC standards. In fact, Bill Hurd, the lead designer of these machines, actually signed off on the FCC requirements with the 128D plastic case. So this was always gonna be the plan for the 128D and somehow we ended up with the metal case DCR. I don't know the full story behind that. I'm sure maybe there's something out there on YouTube that explains it, but um, yeah, bit of an oddity that even though this would have passed FCC standards, they still went with this. So looking inside, things are quite different between all three. Uh, it's actually these two that are probably more similar though. Although we do obviously have built-in disk drives and built-in power supplies on the D models. And it's actually the plastic case D that has that noisy fan. And that is actually built inside the power supply. Well, it's coming directly off the power supply. It actually just sits underneath this metal case and it runs at full speed the moment you turn the machine on. So um, that's somewhat annoying. The DCR does not have a fan. Obviously things are a little bit more efficient in here and we'll take a close look at the actual boards in a second. But as you can see, there is a lot more empty room in the DCR. Now, if we were to take a 1571 disk drive, and basically place that there. I'll just remove the power supply and stick that here. You can see that these two start to look a lot more similar than this over here. So yeah, basically this is a 1571 just like this. It's just been taken out of its box. It does seem to have a different controller board, but there's probably a few different versions of the 1571. And yeah, that's really the only difference. Um, and then the way it's hooked up to the actual main board is slightly different. And obviously it's being powered straight from this power supply. Whereas this one has this built in power supply, which is a little switch mode job that normally sits inside its case. Let's remove some of this stuff and take a close look at the actual main board itself. All right, so now we can get a good view of the main boards themselves. And you'll notice that these two, as I was saying, are pretty much the same. The only main differences being that there is a reset switch for the 1571 disk drive. And on this board, it's just a blank space. And likewise, the power switch and power connector uh, are missing and populated on there. The keyboard connector is just a pin header here, whereas over here we've got our 25 pin, uh, well, DB25. And the floppy disk drive connector is actually on the board here, whereas again, it's just a unpopulated space over here. That is pretty much it. Obviously I've got an arm SID on this one because the original SID that was on this machine was dead. Uh, but normally these ones come with the 6581 SID, whereas the DCR actually comes with the 8580 SID. Um, that really is 
about the only difference, at least between these two boards. Apart from that, they're basically the same. Now on the DCR, things are very different. Uh, the power connectors are in the middle of the board. Our floppy disk connectors are also around where the floppy disk was because all of the actual floppy disk control logic uh, is actually part of the main board. So everything is cost reduced, hence the CR thing. So a lot of these chips, like the RAM is consolidated along with a lot of the logic. Um, you can see here our two banks of 64K RAM has pretty much been reduced to a four 64K um, ICs. So yeah, everything has been squeezed down. The biggest difference uh, when it comes to video display is the VDC actually has 64K of RAM dedicated to itself, whereas on the older boards, it only has 16K. So the VDC can support up to 64K and that's what they've done with the DCR. Um, and I might actually, it's pretty simple just to upgrade the RAM on the older boards uh, to 64K and then you've got 64K available to the VDC. Not that it matters that much as there's not a lot that can take advantage of it. Uh, apart from a few demos and I think maybe some of the um, the business software, but it's still, it's nice just to upgrade it just because we can. So I might look at that, but um, yeah, beyond that, that is pretty much the main differences. And obviously you can see over here with that tape port, as I was saying earlier, there's no way to actually plug anything into it apart from a cassette tape pretty much well the data set so um yeah that's a, a bit of a bummer and a bit of a downside to the dcr version it is interesting that part of the pcb over here has actually been broken out i'm guessing that they've had something else in that space that just snaps off possibly the drive led by the looks of it it's probably originally part of this board and it's just cheaper to get it printed on there and then just snap it out and mount it to the front of the case. The power LED doesn't look like it's been taken out of another part of the board. That probably was printed separately. So um, yeah, that is it for the internals, so to speak. So let's throw them all back together and maybe you can decide for yourself which one you would prefer. Obviously, assuming that you can even find one of these machines because they're not that easy to come by these days, but at least you'll be armed with a bit of knowledge if you do come across one. So I'll throw them all back together and we'll take a closer look. So given the option, which one would I prefer? Well, I do like the look of the flat 128. Then again, I also like the desktop look. So that's a hard choice. Given that the flat 128 would also need a power supply. And if you wanted 1571 disk drive, this actually ends up taking up more space, especially if you want to pair a monitor with it because you cannot stack it on top of the unit itself. And the setup that I had at the start of this video, that monitor was practically falling off the bench. So um, the flat is cool. Uh, it's probably good that the keyboard's built in because finding a keyboard for the D models can be quite a challenge in itself. So I do like the flat and not to mention, it's also got the cassette port in the right spot and it has a 6581 SID, which I just prefer the sound of probably cause I'm just used to hearing that particular SID. With the 128D, I do like the fact that it's got the carry handle on the side and you can store the keyboard underneath. Not that I'm really gonna be taking it anywhere but what I really don't like about it is this power supply. It's just distractingly noisy and there isn't really much way around that. I mean, you could unplug the fan, but you'd probably eventually cook the machine. So that's probably not such a good idea. Um, beyond that, again, the 6581 SID and the cassette port is where you'd expect it to be. I do really like this machine, but that power supply the 128 DCR, I like the metal case. Uh, it's unfortunate that it doesn't have a handle or anywhere to store the keyboard. 
so you can't really pack it all up. You're always going to have the keyboard floating around with you somewhere and the cassette port is in the wrong place. As I said, I'm also not a huge fan of the 8580 SID, but it does have its advantages depending on who wrote the track and what SID they were aiming to have that track played back on. So that can be a positive. Um, obviously the D, I've got the arm SID in there so I can swap between uh, 6581 and 8580 emulation. But all in all, I think the DCR would be my preferred Commodore 128. It has everything built into it, so power supply, disk drive, obviously. It has minimal amount of chips, so there's less things that can go wrong, and most of them are gonna run cooler than, say, the original 128D. The biggest downside is where that tape port is located, but uh, not having a very noisy power supply is definitely a big bonus, even though I've replaced the one in this. The original power supply didn't have a fan either, so. I think I would take the 128 DCR given the option. Um, all that being said, the 128 DCR is the only one of these that I'd actually don't own. So that's gonna go back to the owner and uh, I'll be left with these two. Now, given that I really like the D and really the only downside to it is that noisy power supply, I've got a plan for that. So, um. Coming up sooner rather than later, I dare say, we're gonna upgrade the power supply in the 128D and get rid of that noisy as hell fan. Without that, I think the 128D would be the winner. So in stock configuration, I'd still take the 128 DCR, but I wanna know your thoughts. So leave a comment down below, which of these machines would you prefer? Or if you've already got one of these machines, would you prefer one of the other ones after watching this video? Let me know down below and I will catch you all in the next one. A massive thanks to the people that support me on Patreon. And if you wanna do the same, you can find links down below. You'll get ad-free access and early access, all that kind of jazz, behind the scenes stuff as well. And um, until next time, thanks for watching the Retro Channel. Bye.